Uh, my name is uh, John Paul Thorbjornsson and uh, Roy Houston will be, and myself, will be talking about the crypto economics of enterprise blockchains. Um, and we'll talk a bit about our background. Uh, we'll talk about what we think crypto economics is, um, and what we can essentially construct it down to just mechanism design. Um, and then we want to draw a parallel between what we've known of security um, and our current regime of incentives um, and define what could be a new, a new form of uh, the observable security and the correct incentives uh, that is actually, in one word, scalable. Um, and then we're going to finish off with an example of how this is being implemented into this Sky Network um, and that will we'll field questions at the end. So myself, uh, I've been in blockchain for about five years. Um, I've done a couple of ICOs last year, ICOs, scammer, yeah, whatever. But we are actually fundamentally pursuing uh, decentralized characteristics um, and to enable people with have permissionless and open access to finance uh, through crypto economics. Uh, we, I'm the director of Bounty Source, which is the uh, largest open source software bounty hunting platform in the world. We've got about 50,000 uh, developers all around the world that uh, use Bounty Source. Uh, and it's also returning, because what we notice with open source software is the economics behind maintaining it uh, and producing it is currently uh, misaligned. And we see incidents like recently the, uh, the case that there was a, a faulty or a malicious bit of code inserted in the, into a code play module that's been used by millions of developers around the world because of misaligned economic incentives around the maintenance of open source software. Um, and also, we're building a Sky Network, which is over the next 30 years, we want to transform the world's um, essentially airline industry to be completely autonomous with no pilots or air traffic control. Uh, Rory as well, he give a brief background. He's also a pilot. He's flying those aircraft, uh, tech entrepreneur, and with me, building Sky Network. So like I alluded to before, we believe that crypto economics is actually just mechanism design. Um, so we want to talk a bit about that. Uh, and mechanism design is actually a well-researched and well-founded bit, uh, bit of the industry. So we hope to borrow upon some concepts that you might be familiar with. Uh, we'll touch briefly on DLT and the crossover between, uh, well, the definition of mechanism design as uh, characterized in a DLT. Um, and then we'll talk about the regime that we're probably familiar with, which is trust-based security architecture, uh, trust-based incentive models. And then we'll shift that to how we can change it to be to have crypto economic security models uh, and incentive models. And we'll use Sky Network as an example of how we're building that. So uh, this might be a familiar diagram to some of you. Uh, but inherently, if you can uh, essentially perceive it, that we have space X, which is the, the kind of the outcome space, as in given a essentially like a game design or arena or a collection of rational actors. We have our starting resources and then our final outcome. So what we're interested to know in is the equilibrium state. As in, given, given a, uh, an arena, where will this converge to? And what is the equilibrium? And if we assume there's rational actors in our, in our community, in our essential organization, or in, in even our game, then we can try and work out what the equilibrium is. Um, so we'll just step through that. So for a desired outcome in SpaceX, with the starting resources in space zero. What should be the mechanisms that allow rational actors in space G, and we define rational actors as actors that uh, essentially will try and exploit the utility function to maximize it and be profit seeking. Uh, irrational actors uh, is essentially a bit harder to predict and a bit harder to model because you, you essentially don't know how they will act. So if we assume rational actors in space G, who can send messages into your ecosystem, what is the final equilibrium state? So if we know where the equilibrium state is, then we can essentially work back in order to change the mechanisms. And that's, that's crypto economics in a nutshell. So cryptographically enforced mechanism design allows micro incentives to be essentially scaled throughout the entire, entire structure. Um, of, your, of your system. And when they are cryptographically enforced, it means that you don't need, you reduce the compliance costs. You don't need to cross check everything and ensure that the rules have been followed. You know the rules are going to be followed because uh, it's, it's not possible to just skirt around um, essentially the, the, cryptogra the cryptographical primitives. Um, so that allows us to design, uh, essentially design the rules of participation in the network. 
And once we have the rules of participation or even the rules of access in your network, then you can create scale of incentive design. And if you treat those rational actors as, as actors that will try and exploit the utility functions, then you can try and steer them at a point um, to, to essentially get them to converge to an equilibrium. Now, what's is important is it becomes leaderless. You no longer need people or entities or agencies or organizations to create the rules because they have already been created. And they've already factored in all possible types of rational actors. Rational actors actually include attackers in this case. And we'll see why this is important. And that's if you remove the leaders and you remove the uh, possibility of a centralized entity organization uh, creating the rules, then you can have scalable social contracts. Um, and we can see this with Ethereum whereby the cost of computation is exceedingly high. The cost of storage is exceedingly high. And what that cost is giving us, uh, we'll sacrifice in that cost for a much, much lower social cost. That is, anyone can now access a decentralized and open, permissionless network of finance. Um, and a good example of this is MakerDAO, which is a supranational uh, organization that is essentially created by nothing but smart contracts and very, very sound crypto economics. There's over one and a half percent of the entire Ethereum circulating supply locked in the MakerDAO contracts. And it's essentially emitted about $60 million worth of a stable coin called DAI. Nothing but crypto economics, no leaders. Highly scalable. So and why we want to do this is essentially to solve the tragedy of the commons. For so long, there's been the tragedy of the commons, whereby if you uh, essentially put in into a public space a public good and you do not enforce the rules of access to that public good, then very, very quickly, rational actors trying to exploit the utility functions will essentially overutilize that public good. And we eventually lead to a point where uh, it's not optimally used, optimally distributed. And we use governance and governments and local councils to essentially govern how we treat public goods. But now for the first time ever, we can use smart contracts and crypto economics to take over that and make it scalable. So essentially, the sustainable allocation of limited resources. Um, and we're going to talk about a public good. A public good is a good that everyone can access to at the same time. Uh, and it should be optimally used and utilized by everyone in the essentially your ecosystem. And what's most important is now that the interests of the organizations are aligned with the interests of the participant. So as they attempt to exploit their utility functions and extract value out, they serve to strengthen the network and grow it. Um, and nothing's more true of this than Bitcoin, which is just pure free market dynamics. So we can, well, let's look at Ethereum kit economics and actually dive down into four main parts. I won't dwell on this too heavily, but we can, we'll choose one, the coin-based transaction. So every block, a coin-based transaction emits an asset that has value to a miner that has expended energy to validate the block. That is the incentivized behavior of that miner. And we're assuming the miner is a rational actor. What are they disincentivized to do? Well, submit invalid blocks because they're not going to get paid. And the outcome is a heavy chain that's cost hit overwrite. And essentially, that's what you, the emission of the Coinbase transactions is paying for. And we can go right down to even the user. The user is our rational actor. They need to submit sufficient mining fees in order to get the transaction process. The disincentivized behavior then is uh, doing denial of service attacks from the network, creating nuisance transactions. And the outcome is essentially that a fee market is created, a valuable transactions are processed. And we can look at that, we can observe it, we can make empirical statements around it. And we can treat our actors as rational. I should say though that these agents can also be attackers. But we can see that attackers also have a cost uh, in order to perform. So they essentially compute the utility function and work out, should I be attacking this network or not? Is, do I, can I get more gain out of attacking this network? Now, if you're following the Ethereum space this year, in June, I think it was July, we had a smart contract in Ethereum that had about $11 million worth in it. And it was essentially a FOMO game, like a pyramid game. More and more users would put in Ether and attempt to be the last person to do so. Now, it got to a point where the cost of attacking the network, as in being a miner that was trying to prioritize transactions in order to influence, actually exceeded the cost of losing that block. So eventually we saw a rational actor exploit that loophole and withdraw $11 million out of the, out of the contract. Um, but hey, rule is code, and that was actually 
part of the smart contracts design. We're all familiar with DLT, so from the centralized ledger network where there is a leader right through to a decentralized ledger network uh, where it was some, somewhat permissioned um, but essentially decentralized without a, without a leader. So if we want to move from the left to the right, we now just now start thinking about what those rational actors are going to be doing in order to work out what the equilibrium will be. And that's, that's important. So my position is that DLTs re require crypto economics. And it, well, any form of DLT that has public or semi-permission access need rules of access. So that's an axiom that is true in and of itself. Because you cannot have a public good or a public um, source of data that doesn't have rules of access. So if you have rules of access, then you now have compliance and trust problems. And if you have compliance and trust problems in order to determine that your rules of access are being followed, then you have scaling problems because you can't scale and cross-check every, everyone's um, as they access that public good. So if you can't scale, then it removes any advantage of having a DLT in the first place. Now you can solve this by having crypto economics. Now a case study of the uh, from my perspex, perspective of the Trade Lens blockchain. Um, obviously, it was announced, announced in uh, January this year. Um, IBM, it was IBM Hyperledge instance, and my asked led. We've seen a slow start to adoption of this blockchain. Um, it's even been publicly rejected by mass, uh, their rivals. So when this blockchain is supposed to solve a lot of the problems with supply chain and shipping and improve transaction times and get containers move around with a lot more efficiency, you know, what, what could have gone wrong? And, what may be used to fix this blockchain or fix this uh, ecosystem, rather. So when I looked at this instance, I first thought to myself, what are the rules of access? Well, when I dug deeper, Maersk own all the IP, and they control the access, which is it's the first problem there is, why would you join a network in which you only benefit uh, an, an individual or an entity? And what are the costs? Well, the costs of training, migrating, running in the nodes, Who's subsidizing that? If the only incentive to subsidize that cost and give up the data to a centralized entity is faster shipping after use of that, then it kind of goes again and the incentives aren't there, then rather the incentives aren't strong enough to encourage uh, these, the participants in this business network or consortium to join in the first place. So how can we fix it? First of all, I think that the rules of access need to be codified. The leaders need to be removed and on-chain governance you should be utilized so that everyone in this consortium, or consortium rather, have the ability to influence the setting of rules. The costs need to be subsidized with greater transparency. We can emit a block reward to cover the costs of running the infrastructure. We can use transaction fees to push complexity to the edges so that load balancing is not done in a centralized way. It's done using free market dynamics. We may need to make the incentives clearer, monetize the data sharing, and use the concept of slashing an opportunity cost to prevent any self-interested activity in this network that doesn't advance the interests of the consortium. So that's perhaps how we can fix the trade lens blockchain. So therefore, we have a paradigm shift that, well, the statement is that trust-based models are inferior to crypto economic models. And we'll, we'll take a bit of a deep dive into that. So when I mean trust-based security architecture, I mean that if anyone here has an iPhone and uses iCloud, you trust that your photos are not being sold by Apple. And they release blog posts, they have you know, information on the website saying that you use the latest military and encryption. But essentially, it's a, it's a black box. You don't actually know if Apple haven't built in backdoors to your iMessage, or they're not exploiting your iCloud user data, a bit like how perhaps Google or Facebook do. It's a complete back box. We have to trust that Apple aren't doing it. And yes, Apple are putting up their brand on the line and they're putting up their profits on the line to do that. But inherently, you need to trust that they don't have another agenda, another hidden agenda where they could be making more money by selling your data. And you can see this everywhere. Um, so here, wow, a uh, encrypted messaging app. You know, they, uh, the uncompromising, uncompromising security and dash lane here where you store your passwords. We, uh, you know, we can't read your passwords, so, but how can you trust that? Whereas a crypto economic security model, you remove all trust. You just simply need to observe it because attacking the network is part of the mechanism design of that network. And now we know that attacking has a cost and everyone can observe that cost. So if you look at Bitcoin, we know 
we can actually pull out our calculator and work it out. What is that cost? The current hash power is about 50 million terahash. The cost to acquire 51% of that hash, the capital expenditure, is about $1.7 billion using the latest mining infrastructure. The one hour rewrite of operational expenditure is about a quarter of a million dollars. And the number of days to rewrite the entire chain is 260. These are all empirical figures. So now we know the cost to attack that network and displace that ledger. And these are, these are numbers, um, and we can do the same for Ethereum, but we know that any attacker needs to first spend this money in order to pull it off. Now these are proof of work um, blockchains. The difference between proof of work and proof of stake is the capex and the opex is external to the network. On a proof of stake network, the attacker needs to acquire the asset first, which has some interesting dynamics because it causes large price action. And that price action can be observed in markets. So the difference between a proof of work blockchain and a proof of stake blockchain is you may not know if someone's am amassing the OPEX and CAPEX in order to attack. You just don't know. They could have, you know, a nation state actor who wants to take down Ethereum might have amassed already, you know, very, very large mining farms that we don't know of. And they could turn it on literally right now and uh, rewrite the chain. We don't know. But in a proof of stake network, you will see that price action. So you will know in advance if someone is even thinking about attacking the network. And that's the paradigm shift. So we've gone from these trust-based, so just taking a step back. So we've gone from trusting that an entity who's holding your data or processing your transactions or moving your assets around um, based on their word and their word alone, or perhaps their brand power, to literally observing it and going, actually, what is the likelihood that this network is under attack or is about to be attacked? And if you start putting assets on these, these networks, and Ethereum supports a lot of tokenized assets, you should know that if you're putting, say, a billion dollars worth of assets to be tokenized on Ethereum, you should know that the attack cost should be far more than a billion dollars. Um, and that's the paradigm shift. Now, we're going on to incentive models here. So currently, the trust-based incentive models um, are not transparent and uh, are not clear. And, but hey, the organization needs to make money. It needs to fund its operations uh, and needs to pay for staff and, and to grow. But we're not clear on how those incentive structures work and what the point of equilibrium is. Because these price tiers can change, these product lines can change without a moment's notice. So now we know, and we do not know what the point of equilibrium is. We don't even know if there's even rational actors on, in, on the network. But in a crypto economic incentive model, it's much, much more clearer. So you might have seen headlines like this, um, large amounts of money being moved around uh, by these blockchains. But what are actually the incentives? Who's paying for, this, uh, for these features and for this utility? Well, if you look at it, in the same block that $200 million is moved on Bitcoin, there was an $80,000 block reward. So the, the network which allowed uh, that large transaction, that allowed that utility to the user, was being subsidized by the same network. In the, in, and that was an $80,000 block reward in that 10-minute block. And of Litecoin, not as much, but again, the network was paying the miners to process uh, that function. So it's, but it's much more clearer. We can pull out a calculator and work these things out. Um, now, then we realize that, and essentially the point is that trust-based incentive models are more what you would call taxation, whereas the crypto economic model is more akin to inflation which is almost a hidden, a hidden tax. Uh, it's a hidden network fee, but in the case of uh, the, correct, well, the correct implementation of these inflation models is something that is mathematically sound and cannot change. And that's probably one of the reasons why people point to Bitcoin all the time and uh, trying to draw the parallel with it being a store of value because we know it's monetary policy right through to 2140. And these numbers will never change. So now, we, as well as all the other actors in the network, know the incentives of the nodes or the entities that support the network and who's paying them. So we'll now switch over to Sky Network and I'll get Rory up here to essentially discuss how Sky Network is uh, using crypto economics to shift from trust-based security and set of models to crypto economic.
Thanks, JP. Hi, everyone. My name is Rory, um, co-founder of Sky Network. What I'm going to do now is uh, take you through some of the concepts that JP has just talked about and how we're going to transition from a trust-based uh, ecosystem to a crypto economic incentivized ecosystem. Um, before I talk about the problem statement, is there, are there any aviation aerospace professionals in the room? Okay, cool. That gives me a starting point. So over the last 20 years, I've th flown about three and a half thousand hours on multiple aircraft um, all across the spectrum from autonomous right through to fast jets and everything in between. Aviation is going through a paradigm shift at the moment. And that paradigm shift is the move from manned aviation to autonomous aviation. And it's about a 50 year window. We're about a third of the way through it where uh, more and more use cases for aviation are turning fully autonomous. Urban air mobility is coming very quickly and it's just one use case for uh, fully autonomous aviation. Let's take a look at the scalability problem here. Now, in a manned aviation world, every pilot that's in the, every aircraft that's in the sky has an associated pilot and an associated air traffic controller of some variety. Uber here have proposed what looks like a central station for urban air mobility. Now, Los Angeles Airport will process about one to two aircraft movements per minute. Uber, with all of their data around uh, people movement, want to process about 10,000 people per hour through one of these nodes, which equals about 2,000 aircraft movements per uh, hour, which is an aircraft taking off or landing every two seconds. The problem here is scalability. How can we achieve that throughput without full-scale autonomy? And the simple answer is we can't. So let's talk about how we're going to get there. The answer is distributed ledger technology and using crypto economics to uh, achieve the scalability solutions that JP started to talk about already. The goal, of course, is to allow interoperability between large-scale drone networks in what is a finite piece of airspace. Now, that airspace is a shared public good. So we need to have a way to achieve scalability within that shared public good. The way to do that is to enable machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication through a trusted single source of data truth. And that's what distributed ledger technology can do in the aviation world. So let's take a quick look at who the participating actors are in this ecosystem and how they are incentivized. So we start with the user or the client. So it might be the paying passenger or the client who wants to have parcel A delivered from uh, one side of the city to the next. They bring a lot of value to the ecosystem and pay for the services. In the middle, we've got um, ecosystem participants like the permissioned aircraft, which is the hardware endpoints. The infrastructure nodes that those aircraft want to land on the data suppliers and third-party applications are uh, data contributors like, let's call it a Bureau of Meteorology or um, uh, any, any kind of data supplier that is adding uh, data of value to the network. A third-party application might want to read the blockchain and uh, use that information for public dissemination or for regulatory oversight. The manufacturers contribute value to the ecosystem by innovating with hardware, uh, with sky pads and other pieces of technology which will advance uh, the ecosystem. And then finally we've got the regulators. The important thing to take out of this slide is that um, all of these ecosystem participants are economically incentivized in some fashion or another. So how do we solve the tragedy of the commons with all of these participants? The objectives here are obviously to achieve scalability in aviation autonomy. There's a number of layers to this from security, compliance, incentive, and then social that we're going to step through. And we're going to use crypto economics to do it. Back in 2014, there was a fire that was started by a rogue employee of the Federal Aviation Administration. What we do as paying passengers on our airlines today is we trust that um, the pilot up the front is going to look after us and keep us safe. We trust that the air traffic controllers on the ground are going to um, issue us a clearance which is not going to collide with another aircraft. What happened here was the control centre fire shut down that particular uh, ecosystem and thousands of flights across the United States and internationally were either cancelled or delayed, which had huge economic impacts throughout, uh, throughout 
um, the environment. In 2015, um, a rogue pilot, German Wings, you probably remember, flew the aircraft into the ground and killed about 170 people. That was a trust-based security system, and it failed. What we do now is by using crypto economics and distributed ledgers, we can observably view the value of the ecosystem and we can calculate the cost to attack. So now, <clears throat> if a network has $100 billion of value within it, which can be observed through the native asset, which is directly proportional to, uh, we can calculate the attack cost. If I want to fly from one side of the United States to the next on an aircraft that costs $250 million to fly, but I know that the attack of that network is going to cost multiple billions uh, of dollars, then I'm going to feel pretty comfortable that that network is extremely secure. Moving on to the compliance layer. Today, as a pilot or an, uh, an air operator of some kind trying to produce an aviation service, I need to go through a whole host of compliance checks um, with regulatory authorities. I have to go and get trained as to how to fly these aircraft. Um, and then once I've got all those ticks in the box, uh, you as the end user are trusting that I'm going to adhere to those rules and adhere to the, uh, the, the bounds and constraints of my license. There's no way to computationally enforce that, that, uh, that compliance. In a crypto economic environment of full scale autonomy, we've now got economic alignment such that if a machine endpoint was to break the rules of the network, there is an economic uh, slashing or impact for that aircraft or that operator of that aircraft. And we can do that through a staking mechanism. So an aircraft can be deployed to the network with a particular financial stake, and the rules are built in such that if that aircraft breaks the rules, uh, they take a, an economic hit there. Moving down uh, to the next layer, we're looking at uh, trust-based incentives. So. Today, in the aviation ecosystem, if you want to go and extract value from the ecosystem because you uh, see a great startup or business idea, you add value to the ecosystem, but you're going to charge for that. So you're actually going to extract, uh, extract value in the form of fees and payments to deliver your product or service. There's no vested interest in you adding value back into that ecosystem. You're actually just trying to extract value in the form of, I guess, traditional capitalism. It's a profit-seeking motive, um, and every actor is siloed into uh, driving profits for themselves there. This one is particularly exciting. So through uh, crypto economics, we can actually incentivize network actors to reinvest back into the ecosystem. If we know our ecosystem is worth $100 billion today, and there is $4 billion through inflation in the network that is being fairly distributed to network nodes and network actors that are participating in network security, for example, or providing a service to the network, then those particular actors have a vested interest in the increase in that network value. So that drives reinvestment of that money back into the network to take it from $100 billion to $200 billion. Remember, the native asset of the network is directly proportional to that network value. And we see, we see this today with, uh, with permissionless blockchains like, uh, like the EOS uh, platform. Um, it, it behoves the block producers to invest heavily into the ecosystem because they want the value of that network to go up. All right, and the final level, level that we'll talk about is the social level. So um, today's bureaucracy and uh, I'll call it regulatory oversight of the aviation ecosystem is very slow, um, it's very complex, and it doesn't scale well. And I, I, what I mean there is that uh, humans are very ingrained in these processes and they have to go and spend a lot of time and money um, achieving their licenses, achieving their ratings, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of operational and administrative overhead that uh, right down to the printing of documents which just doesn't scale. Everything that I've said there can be programmed into a blockchain. What this does is it can incentivize participation. So me wanting to provide a new drone service that nobody else has thought of before, uh, I can now go and buy my drone uh, off 
uh, DJI or another major drone manufacturer, and with uh, with coded rules built into the network, I can deploy that aircraft without having to jump through those unscalable uh, mechanisms to uh, achieve licenses and ratings, etc. What this does is achieve social scalability. So the costs to join and participate in the network have uh, aggressively dropped. All right, I'll just pass over to JP for the wrap up. Awesome, so we started off by defining mechanism design and correlating that with crypto economics. So we can essentially cage it um, and define it uh, empirically. We talked about trust-based security models and trust-based incentive models and define a, a new regime um, of security and incentive to allow us to scale rapidly um, and grow networks faster. So we view that crypto economics is then scalable mechanism design deployed in a trustless manner. And DLTs with any form of public access require crypto economics so that they converge to an equilibrium which is known, assuming rational actors. And if we do that, then security becomes observable and transparent. And you no longer need to trust brand power or trust you know, quarterly reports or, or trust regional jurisdiction. You can just look at the network and make your own decision. And lastly, uh, incentives create a positive externality. So what I mean by that is, let's say the carbon tax. The carbon tax is a negative externality that's attempting to force uh, actors around the world to minimize the, uh, essentially the production of carbon. If instead we had a positive externality, then that would happen a lot faster. Instead of penalizing people for not obeying, you're rewarding them for abiding by uh, essentially the, the outcome space that you want to push them to, in this case, to minimize carbon um, in, in our atmospheres. Uh, we haven't seen a positive externality yet for that particular case. Um, I think that uh, large-scale proof-of-work deployment, such as the Bitcoin network, is the, for the first time ever an, a positive externality to reducing our reliance on fossil fuels because it forces the network into using renewable energy sources because uh, it is not profitable to run on fossil fuels. So for the first time ever, I believe that uh, Proof of work incentives are driving a positive externality to reducing carbon emissions. And that's just an example of, of that. And well designed crypto economics should create highly scalable social constructs and, and contracts uh, to minimize the cost of joining, to maximize the, the value um, extraction as well as the value uh, creation. So that is fundamentally win win for all participants in the network. So that's our kind of our points here today. Would love to field some questions on it. Um, the Sky Network is hopefully launching next year. Um, you're most welcome to join the network as one of the early validators. Um, please get in touch with us if you'd like to participate um, in a bootstrapping of a brand new network. Do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for, for exploring. Uh, my name is Karen. Is it better? Yeah, okay. My name is Karen. Thank you so much for exploring uh, your idea. To my experience, rules we are sometime doing, we redo if um, some of those con um, constraints change, and we have to. So isn't it a little bit risky to decide today? We know the rules, these are the right ones. Just because I, I'm very, um, I uh, find it uh, sympathetic to, to have this uh, code is law idea on the one hand. But on the other hand, to my experience, we, all may, we are not brilliant in, in rulemaking. Uh, so we always have to change them again and again. And how do we cope with this? It's a really good question. And it's a question that's been fraught after at the moment in the current um, Web3 world. The answer to it is on-chain governance. Uh, instead of using out-of-band and social governance and you know, proof of social media, we instead revert to uh, essentially codified governance on, on the blockchain. And those actors which have the most stake in the blockchain, running the most nodes, running the most miners, committing the most capital, then get to influence the direction. We, that does lead to plutocracies. Um, there are some rules, uh, sorry, some, some breakthroughs in quadratic voting and liberal radicalism that Glenn Whale put out. May I, yeah. may I uh, um, conflict 
uh, or say, say something um, conflicting to this. It seems to be a, li a little bit like a coding arrest. Um, um, oh, is anybody German here and knows the name for aristocratie? Uh, do you know what I mean? Those special guys who are brilliant in doing um, mining and then get the rules and they are deciding, uh, or this is the new privileged um, area of decision takers because they are the biggest one, you know? This might be something um, yeah. against uh, or, or an argument. I'm not sure at the moment. Perhaps some, some, some very bright people should take it, but it's a, um, it's it's a very good question. Uh, it's difficult to answer. I think the solution is direct democracy. Um, it is a democracy of the form or the contract similar to liberal radicalism. I encourage you to re check it out. Uh, a very famous economist called Glenn Wow has issued a paper recently on liberal radicalism. But essentially, it empowers the minority and takes power away from uh, essentially capital intensive players. Yeah, I will um, I'll certainly share it after this. If you just literally jump on, on Google, liberal radicalism, and there's a lot of media out. But it essentially, uh, for the first time, allows a fair distribution of voting power that doesn't fall, um, is not vulnerable to attacks of plutocracy, which is the richest get richer and more powerful. Um, because in this case, the voters with the most vote are actually the minority players. Um, direct democracy and on-chain governance is a very dynamic part of the blockchain industry right now. Um, they are excellent questions, um, as yet unsolved, uh, but we hope to push towards away from this representative democracy that's quite inefficient, towards direct democracy that is opt-in, that allows anyone to help influence the setting of those rules. But it's a good question. It's also important to note that there's going to be quite a transition period before we get to any kind of mature on-chain on governance system, um, and there will be there will be a lot to jump through before then. No problems. Thanks. Liberal radicalism. Thank you. Uh, just double check my understanding. Did you attribute the successful DAO attack to the use of trust-based models versus cryptography? Even though, I mean, it's not, it was a code problem. And actually, it, it proved that code is not the law. The, the problem with the DAO attack was the the uh, Ethereum blockchain at the time, and still doesn't, have any form of um, working on-chain governance. So a network failure like the case of the DAO, um, I would say it was a network failure rather than a, a protocol failure, uh, should have required on-chain governance to correct it in, in the direction that the community wanted it. The community wanted the fork. However, they had to hard fork towards it, which, which was divisive. If they had already implemented an effective form of on-chain governance, they could have achieved the same thing. And the fork was good. It prevented a lot of capital loss. Um, and fix the problems at the time. But it should have been affected through on-chain governance as opposed to out-of-band social governance where you don't know who's setting the rules. Did the Ethereum Foundation make the decision? Who, who made the decision? Whereas on, effective on-chain governance allows the decision to be empirically recorded and later audited. Do you, do you think EOS is one example of on-chain governance? Uh, EOS, does have on, EOS doesn't have on-chain governance. EOS has on-chain bribery, um, and it's susceptible to plutocracies whereby the rich gets richer. Um, I don't think EOS is an effective solution. Uh, they've made a lot of shortcuts. I think a better solution is what Tezos and Polkadot and even Cosmos is doing, where users can delegate the, uh, through capital um, allocation um, their votes, but they can instantly, instantly, sh instantly sh uh, shift. Um, it's an unanswered question, but it's a very important part of networks like this. Who gets to decide setting the rules if there's no leaders? And we've been fascinated with this for thousands of years, by the way. We've gone from you know, ev electing our village leaders to religion through to flirting with communism to finally representative democracy today. Representative democracy is very, very inefficient. Look at France right now. Look at, you know, look at our problems right now. We need direct democracy because we need to feel reassured that we can be part of that rule setting. Um, and represent democracy is inefficient. It's 20 years old, and it was a function of electing someone else to travel two hours into the village center. But a network like this, and networks like the one that we brought up with TradeLens blockchain, they need effective on-chain governance, and that's what we're trying to build. Any other questions? So I think uh, that you're really wrong about uh, direct democracy. I think direct democracy, frankly, you know, doesn't work above a certain small level, and representative democracy really is the answer. 
But more, I would say all equally importantly, I'm, look, I'm a lawyer. I've been working in Silicon Valley for 35 years. I think on-chain governance can only cover part of the problems. I mean, um, you know, there's a book called a Machine, Platform, and Crowd where they uh, talked about the fundamental economic uh, theories <clears throat> around, you know, this automated governance and how they just don't work in the real world. You can cover a certain number of problems, but you cannot predict the future completely. And having watched technology companies in Silicon Valley for 35 years and done a thousand venture deals, the idea that you can actually program the rules for all this stuff is a delusion and a dangerous delusion because it leads people into situations like the Dow, which I, you know, I think the fact that they named it the Dow, which is it's like naming something the company, showed the hubris they had. And the the problem with that is the real world is a lot more complex than our ability to predict it. And so you're going to have to have a mix of off-chain and on-chain governance. I don't think you'll ever get to the, at least in the foreseeable future, get to a real on-chain governance solution. Thanks for your input. We got one more question. We had a question here, and then we had time to wrap up. Thank you. A uh, bit of a top of my head question. Um, your last slide said that uh, um, public networks have to use cri crypto economics. Yes. Well, this somehow implies that uh, permission uh, networks don't have to use crypto economics. However, there must be some advantages in using crypto economics. And I would like you to elaborate a bit on that, please. Thank you. No problem. So I think the question was, uh, I, I guess to clarify that, public access doesn't uh, require public blockchain. Um, and in fact, any form of permission blockchain that has large scale of access, so a large consortium that's beyond, say, a, a trust circle of, say, five, four or five participants, uh, that's when it, doesn't, it loses scalability. And it's, it was a solution to scalability in the face of large groups of, groups of actors attempting to access your network. So if you have a small permission blockchain with you know, a handful of entities, you can maintain a, um, a trusting relationship. Your conversion point or your equilibrium point is you will continue to trust each other and you will continue to behove the rules that you've defined. You don't need on-chain governance. You don't need crypto governance in that case. But if you're entertaining a blockchain that has access to um, you know, quantities of agents that far exceed your ability to compliance check and maintain trusting relationships with them all, you're going to need to think about the scalability of your rules of access, and that requires crypto economics. Or, yeah, crypto economics. I think we need to wrap up there. Thanks very much for your input. Um, thank you.